Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Lane Sunday School. Today is December 12th, and our lesson today is on justice and kindness. And the devotional reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7 and 9 through 12. Um, I want to read 2 Samuel 9, 1 to, um, for our key text today. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So I'm not sure if you all are super familiar with, um, with David, but David has a, a lot of time in the Bible. And David, um, when he was younger, Saul was the king and Saul had tried to harm him several times. David had several opportunities to kill him, but he never did. And Saul had a son, Jonathan, and Jonathan and um, David became close friends and Jonathan helped to protect David's life numerous times throughout the body, throughout the Bible. And then, um, because of that, David made promises to Jonathan um, for his, for himself, and for his descendants. And so that is where we're at today. And we are in 2 Samuel. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read the, the reading, and then we'll dig into it a little. Um, David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's house named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. King, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan he is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is in the house of Maker, son of Emil in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar to the house of Maker, son of Emil. When <clears throat> I always mess that up. Thank you. Son of Jonathan. Son of Saul came to David. He bowed down to pray, to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, he said, for I will show, surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him to bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to king, to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. So um, when David became king, it was customary in those times to kill off anyone that might threaten to take the throne from them. And um, so for him to bring Mephibosheth into his house, that was really like not something that would normally happen. So, um, but as you know, Dave, David has always been after God's own heart. So he is extending that kindness um, to him. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start um, the introduction. Khalid Husseini's 2004 no 
novel, The Kite Runner, is a gripping story of childhood friendship, betrayal, and the search for redemption. Set in Afghanistan, the, the story traces life, the life of Amir and the young son of a wealthy family who befriends Hassan, the underprivileged son of his father's servant. The boys become friends, but the difference in status between them leads to a grueling separation that haunts Amir for many years. Some decades later, following Hassan's death, Amir searches for Hassan's son in order to rescue him from abuse and show kindness, show him kindness for his father's sake. Similar themes of friendship, redemption, and rescue arise in the books of First and Second Samuel through the story of David and Jonathan. Long after he could no longer enjoy friendship with Jonathan, David remembered his promises and looked for the chance to show kindness to his friend's son. In the Christian arrangement of the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel are part of the historical books, which are Joshua to Esther. They record the transition from being governed by the Lord, which is theocracy, to an earthly king, which is a monarchy, and that began around 1050 BC. The man Samuel, after whom the books were named, is a pivotal figure in the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. While Samuel was well-respected throughout the land, his sons did not enjoy the same esteem. The Israelites, tired of the abuses of Samuel's sons, demanded that Samuel give them an earthly king like all the other nations. <clears throat> this flew in the face of God's desire for Israel to be priestly, holy nation under his rule. But the Lord said, but the Lord did as they desired, choosing Saul to be king. But Saul did not faithfully carry out the Lord's commands. The Lord rejected Saul and had Samuel anoint David to be Saul's successor. Though Saul was initially fond of David and took him into his court, the king knew that David was chosen to succeed him. And he grew fearful and even murderous when David's renown started to surpass his own. Yet for all Saul's paranoid attacks on him, David consistently refused to harm or retaliate against Saul. In spite of his complicated interactions with Saul, David's most loyal and trusted friend was none other than Saul's oldest, oldest son, Jonathan. Their friendship resulted in a, co a covenant that obliged both parties. Jonathan would protect and support David while David pledged to show kindness to Jonathan's family. Material in First and Second Samuel sometimes is arranged thematically rather than chronologically. So the relationship between events in David's life can be hard to determine. This was especially true of David's ordering the death of several of Saul's sons. It seems at first glance that the incident in 2 Samuel 21 must have occurred after our story, but it could also have been included in the later chapters of 2 Samuel to fit with the other stories about David's fallibility. Clues from the surrounding material place in today's text is some 15 to 20 years after David began his reign in 1010 BC. David had spent much of his time solidifying his control as king over all Israel by defeating enemies both within and without example, or within and without. Saul and Jonathan had been dead for some time. Another of Saul's sons, Ishbosheth, ruled in the northern tribes until his own death, at which time David began to rule over all of Israel. But the tribes had shown their preference for a descendant of Saul on the throne. In situations such as this one, it was often a top priority for a king for a new ruling family to kill off any members of the previous king's household, thereby, thereby eliminating any rivals. David had vowed against destroying Saul's house, both to Saul and to Jonathan. The circumstances of 2 Samuel did not constitute unfaithfulness to his oath. In spite of potential threats to his, to his rule, David determined to keep his promises and spare the lineage of his friend and former king. How could David not know 
whether anyone of Saul's household still lived. For one thing, he had been busy for, with wars, establish, establishing Jerusalem as his capital and trying to move the ark. How was he meant to keep track of who died in all those years? But the answer may be even simpler than that. Saul's family was hiding, knowing that David had been crowned king, first in Judah and then all over Israel. Any remaining sons of Saul would have to fear that they would be executed to prevent them trying to regain the throne. And 1B, to whom can I show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Some have said that David's motives may have involved keeping his enemies close so as to make sure that they did not plot his overthrow. Or, sim or similarly, he may have thought that being kind to Saul's family might score him political points with any remaining supporters of Saul's dynasty. Knowing that people rarely have pure motivations, it is possible that David valued both keeping potential usurpers close and scoring points with Saul's supporters, but his main motivation was neither of those things. David's pledge to Jonathan went so far as to ensure continual kindness to the same, even after the Lord had cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. 2 Samuel 18, 1 through 3. Tells David's military defeat and all of Israel's surrounding enemies. It is fitting that after we hear of David's enemies being cut off from the face of the earth, we hear his determination to find someone to care for Jonathan's sake. So I want to stop here for a few minutes. Um, so if you think back and you, you understand the time, showing kindness, um, for a king to show kindness to someone that wasn't in his court. That was a big thing to begin with. And then for it to be someone that, um, that could threaten his time on the throne, that was even, even bigger. And he didn't do it just to keep his enemies close. He did it because he had made a promise to Jonathan all those years before. So, um, if we think about how maybe that can correlate with our lives today, um, we all have those people that we, that we love and we enjoy being around, but we all have those people that we're like, oh, not them again. <laughs> so maybe we can um, be like David and show those people that are hard to be around extra kindness and, um, and do it from the goodness of our hearts, not just doing it um, to keep our enemies close. So um, that's just kind of what really spoke to me this morning when I was reading. So um, this kindness often describes acts of loyalty or trustworthiness within the context of a promise. The same Hebrew word frequently translated is love when referring to God's actions within the covenant. Kindness like this is built into the character of God. Covenants were struck in situations where a power imbalance existed. At the time that David and Jonathan committed to their own, to their own covenant, Jonathan was the heir to Saul's throne and David was a soldier, albeit a very popular one. By the time David was looking for an opportunity to act on this covenant, Jonathan was dead and David himself was king instead. David's adherence to the covenant years later depended solely on his faithfulness towards Jonathan. Not to spoil, not to um, any possible falling out of their friendship. In verse two, now there was a servant of Saul's house named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba at your service? He replied, Ziba held a very high position among the servants in Saul's household. Even after Saul's death, demonstrated here by being the one called into David's presence. He was the manager of Saul's estate at this point and had become wealthy as a result. Other episodes affirm Ziba's continued status. Ziba would be sure to know all about Saul's remaining descendants. Referring, him, 
to himself at being at David's service, identified Ziba as being loyal to David. This was important to establish if Ziba worried that David might take revenge on the house of Saul, despite the king's claim to want to be kind to someone in the family. However, David had shown time and time again that he did not desire to wipe out Saul's family or his soldiers. Um, in verse three, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness, God's kindness? David restated his question now to a man who should have known the answer. Although the question would not be redundant to Ziba who was hearing it for the first time. The repetition emphasizes for the reader of David's urgent desire, the slight difference of showing God's kindness rather than for Jonathan's sake, recalls God's favor expressed through and as a result of his covenant with Israel. Um, and the second part of that verse, Ziba's knowledge. Ziba, Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. The first mention of the son comes in passing um, note in 2 Samuel verse, chapter 4, verse 4. He was five years old when Saul and Jonathan died in battle. At that time, his nurse fled with the boy, likely thinking that David would come to eliminate him. Unfortunately, though, the boy fell during the flight and suffered permanent crippling injuries. As Ziba spoke, that child would probably be in his early to mid 20s. Ziba did not mention the child's name in his reply to David, but it seems quick to have mentioned his disability. Maybe he knew David would immediately know which son Ziba was referring to. Perhaps he sought to reassure David that Jonathan's son was no threat so that David would not seek to kill him. Or perhaps he hoped that David would do exactly that, relieving Ziba of any obligation to provide for him. In verse four, where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is in the house of Maker, son of Emil in Lodabar. Lodabar was a village east of the Jordan River in Gilead and associated with the, associated with the tribe of Gad. It was located much closer to Ishbosheth's political center. Manaheim, um, then to David's capital in Jerusalem. Although Makir had probably been a supporter of Saul originally, we later learned that he supported David and his men during Absalom's revolt. The outcome of David's inquiry here may have changed the man's loyalties. Nothing is known about Makir's father, Emil. Um, and a promise um, fulfilled, which is in, um, we're gonna start with verses five and six. So King David had him brought from Lodabar with the house of maker, son of Emil, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Mephibosheth, immediately honored David and dressed him in the differential language appropriate to speaking to a king, echoing Ziba's words as a potential rival to the throne, being a son of Jonathan, who was the firstborn son of the dead King Saul. Mephibosheth must have felt the tension in this moment. Accordingly, his first aim was to assure David that he was not a threat to his throne. So if we think about um, Mephibosheth's state of mind, you know, here is this king that could just have you eliminated at the drop of a hat. So he had to be, you know, very unsure of going to see David because it would kind of be like signing your own, it could be like signing your own death certificate. But David um, truly did want to show him kindness. And as we learn that David did show him kindness um, for all of his days. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, David's declaration um, verses 
7, 9, and 10. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So back then, whenever, um, whenever you were king, you had large parcels of land. And then when Saul passed away and Jonathan passed away, those things, all that land no longer belonged to him. So David returning that land is also a really big deal because David could have kept that land for himself because he was the king. So um, that's just another way that he, that God is, um, that David is showing that he, you know, has God's heart and he wants to extend this kindness by giving back all this land that, um, that was taken from him initially. <clears throat> um, given the practice of familial annihilation discussed above, Mephibosheth may have expected to receive anything but kindness from David, but David's immediate offer and reassurance to Mephibosheth that he need not be afraid David's summon was not, as it turns out, a ruse to flush Mephibosheth out of hiding. Instead, he wanted to show him kindness for the sake of his father in order to keep his covenant with Jonathan. Mephibosheth would eat at the king's table, just as David had once eaten at Saul's table. And that itself is like a really big deal because to be invited to eat at the king's table was not something that was granted to anyone. You had to, you had to be in an inner circle to be able to be invited to that table. And sometimes even the people that were in the inner, inner circle of the king were not invited to the table. So that, um, that is also a very significant part of the story. David's desire to restore to Mephibosheth the estate of his father suggests that David had gathered additional information beyond what is stated in the verse. Mephibosheth living in Lo Debar in, Makir, in Maker's house makes it clear that he wasn't living on any of Saul's lands, whether or not he was seeing any of the other benefit from the property. Having had the land, having the land restored, cemented that Mephibosheth could receive whatever wealth was to be made from his grandfather's holdings. Mephibosheth seemed sincerely and humbly grateful for David's kindness to him. Um, Mephibosheth no doubt knew of his father's friendship with David and probably heard stories of Jonathan's aid to David. Verse nine, the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. David had come to possess Saul's land, whether because of his marriage to Michal, Michal or forfeiture to his throne after the failure of Ishbosheth. Brief reign. And I know I really screwed that. <laughs> By returning to <clears throat> Saul's property to Jonathan's son, David executed not only kindness but also restorative justice. Perhaps Ziba had taken advantage of Mephibosheth's disabled condition and commandeered Saul's estate for himself. His motives are not analyzed here, but later events suggest that this would be in character for the steward. Um, verse 10, A, you, you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for it. And Mephibosheth's grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Although Mephibosheth would eat at da in David's house, the land would provide for the rest of his family and for the servants supported through their own work. And um, 10b. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba had apparently grown wealthy as a result of his control over Saul's estate, having 20 servants of his own as well as 15 sons. 
his work on the land would continue to support his own household as well as Mephibosheth's. And verses 11 and 12, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. Once again, Ziba emphasized his loyalty to David, calling himself his servant twice. Though he did not protest David's decree, he nonetheless looked for an opportunity to have it annulled. His chance came years later when David fled the palace during Absalom's rebellion. And you can find that in 2 Samuel um, chapters 15, verses 37 through chapter 16, verse 4. Um, and 11b, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons, whereas Jonathan had loved David as himself. Now David would care for Jonathan's son as his own. David's care for Mephibosheth yields a more satisfying conclusion to the story of David and Jonathan, which otherwise would have ended in a disheartening end. Um, and verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. Jonathan's grandson, Micah, would carry on the family, though one might expect David's sons to have some feelings about Mephibosheth's new role in their family. No hostilities between them are noted here or elsewhere. So, um, so whenever you, uh, whenever you read Old Testament stuff, it can be really hard to understand because the times were different and the way they did things were different from the way we do things now. Um, but it's really, I always find it really interesting to read the Old Testament and just stop and think about how they did do things back then and how the, um, just the hierarchy, you know, the, the king, when a king had a son, then that son knew someday he was going to be king and he was going to inherit all the wealth that the king had. So if you think about that, like in today's terms, if you have a wealthy parent and his children may feel like, well, I'm going to inherit all this wealth when that person dies. And not that that's a great thing to think, but honestly, in today's world and the way a lot of people are so self-centered, that is the way a lot of people think instead of um, thinking about how they can show kindness to others and, um, and follow God's heart. So um, I think that whenever we're reading in the Old Testament, we really have to just stop and and realize how different it is. Because I know when I first started really reading and studying in the Old Testament, I was really like, I don't even think this is going to make sense because things were so different back then. But as I've studied and I've learned, I've really come to realize that even though times are different now and we don't have a king and, you know, our political society is different. Um, a lot of things are, you know, can really correlate between Old Testament times and current, current day times. So I hope that everybody can, you know, even if it's not about wealth, but just showing kindness to, to other people. Like I said, maybe even those people that just, you really don't want to show kindness to, but maybe you can follow God's heart and show those people kindness. So um, I have not seen the timer pop up yet, but I'm sure we're close.